Hello and welcome to episode 398 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? Did you have a nice Christmas? Well, I, I'm, I'm hoping I did because anybody who listens to us regularly will know that at Money to the Masses, we close at Christmas. So it's one of those things I remember when I always worked and we were always fighting to see who could get time off and who couldn't and all that kind of stuff. When we created Money to Masses, we decided, do you know what? No one's working at Christmas. We're not doing that. So if you ever come and work for us, you don't work between Christmas and New Year. It's not part of your holiday entitlement. We just close down and give everybody it free. So it means that this was recorded before Christmas. And that was why I have to almost apologize to people. We always wish everybody a happy Christmas in the Christmas episode. But because we recorded that more than 10 days before Christmas, we just completely forgot and i just said to andy do you know what we never wished anybody a happy christmas so hope you all had a good christmas and i hope that 2023 will be a fantastic year for everybody and happy new year well yeah that's it i mean this podcast comes out on new year's day we have recorded it previously but we can at least say a happy new year to everyone and let's hope that 2023 is a bit better and actually funny enough mentioning 2023 this does give us a reason to let people know what's coming up on today's pod because 2023 is key because you've prepared a piece for the podcast today and invest in peace looking into 2023 and the year ahead yeah so each year it's become a bit of a tradition that I do a podcast episode that is a big chunk of looking at the year ahead and about the possible investment themes. So go back, you'll find last year's episode, which would actually make for good listening because there will be things in there that I mentioned and picked up that actually played out and things that didn't. So it's always interesting because what happens, I do a, an extensive article for 8020 Investor members. So if you want to see the full article and all the details, then of course you can take out a free trial. But then I give some edited highlights on the podcast for people to look out so that is going to be the meaty part of the podcast today but in addition to that i know not everybody will be here for the investment stuff we have published an article on the website for the new year about 50 ways to make extra money so that's online and offline so jordan cox if you'll remember who's a regular on the show and a friend of money to the masses produced a piece of content for us at the close of 2022 about 50 clever ways to make money so what me and andy are going to do we're going to pick our top five ways to make money from that list of 50 each so we're going to have five each that's a total of 10 and then you can look at the article for the rest of them okay so let's get into the pod then so the investing outlook for 2023 what have we got so i'm going to do a, a quick recap of 2022 and then mention some of the themes to look out for in 2023 and now as i make this podcast it is before christmas just before and the santa rally hasn't yet appeared depending on who you ask the santa rally which is where the stock market tends to rally into the year end some people look at it as the whole of december but traditionally it's been between christmas and the new year so the first two trading days of the new year it's not turned up yet maybe it will do after christmas and actually december has been pretty dismal for stock markets but looking at 2022 as a whole the best way to summarize it is that if you look at the typical 60 40 portfolio so 60 percent equities 40 percent bonds then that is down somewhere between 11 and 13 percent year to date so this is just before christmas 2022 so it's been one of the worst years for that type of portfolio and it's been one of the worst years to be an investor actually and that's because both bonds and equities have collapsed now one of the biggest events in 2022 was of course the war in ukraine and it led to some investor risk aversion in both asset classes and others actually but also fueled inflation which caused central banks to tighter monetary policy that means raising interest rates which started to hurt bonds and equities alike so it was a difficult year for investors now I'll be honest, my 50k portfolio on 8020 is down as I make this just 6.5%. So I'm happy with that because if I was a professional fund manager and I was part of one of the multi asset sectors for unit trusts out there, I would have outperformed 84% of professional fund managers. So I'm obviously ecstatic about that because in a year where 
holding equities and bonds, which is the way most people diversify, was a pretty much a disaster. Holding things like cash, gold, and targeted absolute return funds, other strategies came to the fore, and that was pleasing. So what was interesting, if I go back to 2021, so a year ago, what happens, investment banks typically start to produce predictions of where the market will be at the end of the following year. And so it's always interesting to go back and look at what they predicted. Now, just to give you an average, If we take the S&P 500, which is the US stock market, investment banks predicted that the S&P 500 in America would be up 7 to 8%. But obviously, it's down almost bang on 20% as I make this podcast, which is the technical definition of a bear market. So it just shows you how wide of the mark these predictions will be. But there was something else that was interesting. There was clear evidence of recency bias appearing in these predictions. So you've got to imagine if you're an investment bank, you aren't going to say the world's going to end because you're trying to convince people to invest money through you. So you are going to be perhaps more optimistic than most. So you're probably going to be less of a realist at times. But when you looked at 2021, the predictions that were made for that year, so the predictions that were made at the end of 2020, were two pessimistic it turned out they predicted the market would be lower than where it actually ended up at the end of 2021 whereas this year they predicted it will be too high well that's off the back of a really great year of 2021 so you can see what happened 2020 we had the pandemic and obviously that proved a drag on investment markets so going into the next year that recent performance obviously played on investment banks' minds, so they downplayed what would happen the next year. Of course, the market performed strongly in 2021. Now, the predictions for 2022, as I said, were too bullish, and that's because they put too much emphasis on what happened in 2021. So recency bias is where you place more emphasis on what's happened recently when you're trying to predict future probabilities in terms of events that are going to occur. And so you make inaccurate predictions and you make irrational decisions. So that, just as a FYI is very interesting because it just shows even professional investors do it. Anyway, what they predicted for next year, if it even matters, given what I've just told you about how inaccurate they were. I won't go into all the details of different investment banks. You can see the article on the website if you want to go and have a look. But the average prediction is basically for there to be no growth in the S&P 500, almost flat from today. Now, perhaps you could argue that's the most pessimistic they're likely to be because they're saying, well, there's going to be no growth. So given that they're in the market for trying to make people wealthy, perhaps that is as bearish as it gets. But if you look at the range of predictions from different investment banks like Barclays, like Deutsche Bank, the range is quite big. The one bank predicted that the market would fall nearly 10%, whereas another predicted it would grow more than 10% next year. So it just shows you no one really has an idea at the moment where markets are going to go. So I won't dwell on that anymore. But let's talk about some themes and what might happen in 2023. Now, last year at this time, we did have an inkling about Russia and Ukraine because Russia were building forces on the border with Ukraine and nobody knew whether they were going to invade or most people assumed they wouldn't but as it turns out they obviously did and that was the big event of 2022. So what will happen with the Ukraine war nobody really knows but the obvious risks are that if it escalates and we get some kind of nuclear threat or NATO involved directly in the conflict. And that could still cause another wave of risk aversion in markets, so cause another sell-off. But one of the things that has fallen out of the Ukraine war is that countries and economic blocs are now starting to try and become more self-sufficient. I don't mean just in terms of energy, but also in terms of their economies as well. So they're pulling up the drawbridge almost, to make use a metaphor. So it's called protectionism. That in itself could potentially cause problems with supply chains and it could therefore cause problems for investment markets as well. Geopolitics were not really being considered hugely at the start of 2022 but now they are going to be a key theme going to next year because the tensions between China and America are now at probably their worst level in decades and that's even since Trump and part of that is because of the increased competition between the two regions. Of course we've also got the increase in military presence in in the Asia Pacific region, obviously the whole issue about Taiwan. And of course, we've had politicians from America go to Taiwan, which caused a bit of a stir. But the other thing recently, and it might pass some people by, but Joe Biden's administration have even announced export controls over semiconductor chips to China. And that's to try and slow down their technological and military development. So there are tensions that are there and are building. So 
Will we get another US-China standoff in terms of a trade war? We don't know that. So that's going to be something to keep an eye on. The other thing is the dollar strength. Now, if you've been listening to the market updates that I do monthly, the dollar has been pivotal in markets during 2022. It almost pulls together all of those different aspects of what are influencing markets. So that could be fear, that could be central bank policy, particularly obviously the US Federal Reserve. These all seem to come together and play out in the strength of the dollar. So I look at the US dollar index and that's, if you're interested, DXY. So if you type those letters into Google, you will find Yahoo Finance, for example, who do free charts of the US dollar index. And that basically measures the strength of the US dollar against a basket of global currencies. So as the dollar goes up in strength, US stock markets tend to go the other way and they weaken and vice versa. But it also influences a lot of capital flows around the world, which means that it starts to influence how emerging market assets do, how commodities do. I'm not going to go into how it does that. I talk about it on my market update. But the point is the US dollar index goes a long way to explain in many market moves we saw in 2022. It's likely to still do that in 2023. So I picked some levels on that index to be aware of. The one thing I would say, if you look at a chart, it peaked. It was a multi decade high back in I think it was about October and since that point it's starting to weaken so the dollar has weakened against other currencies quite significantly and that started to have a big impact on markets so what we saw at the beginning half of the year we're seeing sometimes the opposite in the second half or the last couple of months of the year I should say if the dollar continues to weaken for example in 2023 then that tends to be good for US commodities, potentially US equities as well. Asian and emerging market assets tend to benefit from a weaker dollar, but it tends to be a headwind for Japanese stock markets because it means the yen gets stronger. And equally, a stronger pound versus the dollar tends to be a headwind for the FTSE 100. So all of these things will come into play. Keep an eye on the US dollar next year because it could tell you a lot about where markets might go. If you want to know more, then obviously you can read more about it on the website. Recession, the R word, that's going to be a big theme of next year. Now, the consensus seems to be amongst economists and central bankers that we are going to see recessions in the major economies around the world. Actually, the Bank of England already thinks that the UK is in a recession. We can also assume that the Eurozone is likely to be in a recession already. The US, not yet, but potentially it could enter a recession next year. Now, this is interesting because if you've got different economies entering recession or not, or entering recession at different stages, that means you could get a divergence in the behavior of their equity markets or their bond markets, because it will also mean that central banks for each area may have slightly different stances on monetary policy. So they might start cutting interest rates if they get a very deep recession in their domestic economy. You might see another economy keep rates higher for longer if their economy is proving robust. So whether we get a recession or not in different economies is going to likely influence markets. Now, if we do get a recession, then it may mean that bonds might finally turn the corner. And there is some school of thought to think 2023 could be a good year for bonds again. Don't forget, if you look at the average bond fund, they're down more than a lot of equity funds. I mean, if you look at the UK gilt funds out there, they're down about 30% year to date. Could we see a turning point? So that means where we see yields fall, which means the price of the bonds and the funds themselves go up. And that's because in a recession, bonds tend to be attractive because they pay a fixed income. And that means that that's attractive when interest rates are getting cut in the wider economy, if we get to that stage. But it may mean that bonds might finally turn the corner. If they do, then that's going to be great for that 60-40 portfolio I mentioned earlier, because the bond part of that portfolio was not providing any diversification in 2022. So you're going to keep hearing that recession word. The other thing from an equities point of view, you might see more of a hunt for yield. So you may see more emphasis placed on slightly defensive equity sectors, but ones that pay good dividends. Now, I do income heat maps on 8020 Investor, which is where I find funds that provide reliable income streams over time. So they tend to be some of the more defensive sectors out there. So that will be something that we'll probably come back to in 2023. It'll be interesting to see. Again, inflation, will that keep going up? They think it's peaked in the UK. And when I say they, the Bank of England thinks it peaked in the UK. But based on their 
ability to predict where inflation has gone in 2022 you obviously have to take some of their predictions lightly if it continues to prove sticky then they may have to keep pushing interest rates up where will interest rates be in 2023 the market is predicting in the uk a peak of about 4.6 percent as i make this so as a reference point we come back next year be fascinating to see where we actually end up but the big thing with central banks next year is the pivot so that's where we go from the tightening of monetary policy, so raising interest rates like the Bank of England is, like the ECB is, like the US Federal Reserve is, to starting to pause that or unwind them and start cutting rates. And now that's not predicted to happen if it does until at least the back end of 2023, probably more likely not until 2024. But that pivot, because markets front run these moves, when that happens, that could be pretty powerful for equity markets and bond markets alike. So there'll be lots of people trying to front run that. Just remember, you don't have to be the first person to jump on the trend. You just have to be on the right trend eventually. So I think there are going to be a lot of people getting their fingers burnt, as they have done in 2022 on a number of occasions, trying to front run the central banks out there. The other thing that will be interesting, I talk about in the piece in 8020 Investor, value versus growth stocks. So value stocks, broadly speaking, if you look at the MSCI, all countries world index for value stocks only was down 8% year to date, whereas growth was down nearly 27%. That's a huge difference. And that's because growth stocks tend to be things like technology. And of course, they have been hurt by the expectation of higher interest rates. Again, I won't dwell on that, but value investing has come back. Will 2023 be a year where that continues? If we enter a recession, it's likely to. I did a piece last week about passive versus active investing and looking forward to 2023, so I won't go over that. A couple of other things. Corporate earnings will be interesting because we've not yet seen the full bite of the cost of living crisis, not in the UK or in other economies that's been reflected in corporate earnings. So I'm talking about supermarkets or any company within the UK economy. Once we get into 2023 and higher interest rates, higher mortgage rates start to bite, people's credit cards become maxed out. We're going to start to see companies struggle if we do go into this two-year recession that the Bank of England has predicted the UK is going to enter, or should I say already entered, then that at some point will feed through logically to the corporate earnings out there so company earnings which will mean that if company earnings fall share prices could do too 2022 has been interesting because ahead of all the quarterly earnings season so every quarter they announce the earnings and the profits from the previous quarter i'm talking about the big companies out there that are listed on the stock exchange and each one was being met with that oh it's not going to be that great or there's a lot of pessimism but i think it was always viewed that they weren't quite as bad as people had feared so the market didn't react aggressively to most of the earnings announcements that could change in 2023 so i think that is something to look at and china is another thing we're going to throw out there i'm not going to dwell on it again but two things on china it was one of the worst performing sectors up until november in 2022 it turned the corner when the chinese government announced the lifting of various covid restrictions so that meant that the economy could potentially start to recover if it does don't forget it's the second largest economy in the world that could provide the fuel for recovery around the rest of the world which given that china is one of the biggest consumers of commodities in the world that could provide fuel for commodity prices and maybe a commodities boom in 2023 which is something that will be interesting to see but again if that doesn't happen because as i make this podcast there are signs that the covid outbreak is spiraling out of control possibly in china if that does and we get more lockdowns then we're going to have the opposite happen where we're going to have restrictions put in place possibly which would hamper supply chain so things that we order globally that might come from or via china would start to be delayed and that would impact economies around the world so there are a few things to look out for in 2023 but one thing to remember that 2022 was very unusual if you invested through 2022 and you've survived it pat yourself on the back because you may have been pound cost averaging all the way through so you might have been investing monthly or you've been buying cheaper and cheaper and cheaper shares all the way through so when the market does eventually recover don't forget looking at a very long-term view then you should potentially benefit but not every year is going to be like 2022 this is part of the rich tapestry of investing so hopefully 2023 will be that much better for the average investor 
Okay, so let's finish off this new year pod with some ways you can make extra money. So Damien and I are going to read out our five favorites each, if you like, from that main list of 50 that we've put on the Money to the Masses website. Make sure that you check out the full article for the full 50 ways that you can make money. And there are a real range of ways that you can make money. So don't just assume that you won't be able to make money in these ways. There's lots and lots of ideas on there. So I'm going to start off with my favorite five. And the reason I've picked these for the pod is I've actually done all of these myself in the past and continue to do a few of them right now. Um, so the first one is write an ebook. Now, for those of you who are new to the pod and who don't know, I've written books in the past. In fact, just a few days ago, it was the 10th anniversary of when I released my first ebook. The long story short is I realized that I had a passion for writing. I had a lot of spare time while I was commuting to work and back each day. So I started writing a book. I didn't know it at the time, but those notes that I was writing down, the funny stories actually ended up being a self-published book that I put up onto Amazon, Kindle Direct Publishing, which anyone can do. And to my surprise, it was a bit of a runaway success and the rest is history. So yeah, that is... That. Sorry, Andy, can I just interject there? Because I can see Andy struggling with this because Andy's trying to in his modest way not tell the full story so those of you who have heard the story before which there will be some of you but many of you won't have heard it Andy published what was the title of the first book Andy you might as well tell people so they can go and find it if they want what was it called a little Christmas present for me let's say yeah. uh, it was as they slept and with with a subtitle the comical tales of a London commuter yeah so Andy wrote the book and self-published it on Amazon. I'm, I'm not going to ruin it for people, but it was a bit of a challenge set by somebody who was a mutual friend about people being bored on trains, and he thought he'd write a, a book in the time it t- took him to do his commute. I've read it. It is very funny. But obviously, a lot of el- other people thought it was very funny because how high did it get into the Amazon chart, Andy? It got into the top 50 of overall books on Amazon and the top of its sort of section. So it was top in comedy and biographies. and But also in America it did as well. It wasn't just in the UK, was it, Andy? And Andy's trying to play it down again, I can see is He also appeared on daytime TV in Australia about the book, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. So I've, seen, I've seen the video clip. Yeah. So this just shows you, this isn't just a pie-in-the-sky dream going, oh, I can write a book. Not everyone can, but Andy did write a book, publicised it, and it became a runaway success. He had a whole series of... I remember meeting Andy just before we started this podcast, in fact, very shortly before, which I think was one of the reasons we met up to discuss making this podcast. And being at a bar and Andy between the point that he'd gone to the bar to buy a drink and come back again he'd sold I don't know how many books between that time which was ridiculous it was like a dozen books already in the space of of minutes when it was flying off the shelf so it is possible take it from me I've seen the numbers Andy showed me them at the time and of course it is repeatable I did I wrote a book as well for money to the masses and Andy obviously used the insights that he had to help that one become the number one business book at the time of writing that so it is possible me and Andy aren't special what Andy is I'm not particularly special but it just goes to show you everybody does have a book in them yeah so don't necessarily be expecting an overnight runaway success I was kind of lucky with timing with with my book but I do anecdotally know of lots and lots of self-published authors who make a very good second income and actually two or three of them is now their main jobs and there are online communities aren't there that you mentioned to me off pod where they talk to each other and help each other with how to publicize it and how to produce the books as well don't they exactly that there's lots and lots of facebook groups and reddit groups where you can go on and get lots of help from other people who will help to cross promote your books and there are lots of tools on amazon as well so that you can give your book away for free to give people a taster and then of course they recommend the book and people come back and buy it at a later date so there's lots of things you can do there definitely try out and even if you don't end up submitting it as a self-published book you may decide that you've got a skill or expertise get it written down because you could even do that as an online course or something as well so there's other ways that you can actually turn that into a future income and also you could get into editing because you end up being more skilled at learning how to edit i know i'm sorry i know i keep blowing smoke at you andy and how wonderful you are but andy also wrote a diet book as well which was a comedy kind of take on that as well so what was that one called andy because i actually really like that one as well what was that interestingly that was the one i was least confident about i really enjoyed writing it but it was a bigger critical success in terms of the press and everything quite like that one so that book was called minimize me 10 diets to lose 25 pounds in 50 days the whole idea was i was bored with dieting so why not try 10 different diets over the course of the same time that i try and fail to do one yeah and so you have to read it again it's got andy's comedy timing in it right your next one andy what was that 
So the next one is on a similar theme, really. It's using your expertise to make money so you can do freelancing in your spare time. So no matter what you're skilled at, you can actually earn money. And there are websites that will enable you to do that, such as People Per Hour and Upwork. Again, the links to those websites are on the article and we'll put those in the show notes. I mean, using examples just from money to the masses, we've used freelancers in the past to do writing for the website, but also to do graphic design, website stuff. So there's lots of stuff. If you've got those expertise and you're employed and you've got some spare time, you can make some extra revenue in your spare time as well. The next one, which I'm a big advocate of, is getting paid cash back for doing your usual spending. So be careful with cash back. Don't get drawn into the lucrative cash back offers just because it offers cash back. Make sure that you're only ever doing it on things that you would purchase anyway. So there are things like cash back credit cards. There are apps such as Top Cashback and Quidco. There are website browsers such as Honey. All of these things enable you to earn cash back through your spending. So make sure that you're maximizing that because over the course of the year, it can add up to several hundred pounds. In fact, I do my everyday spending on an Amex card and it's a cashback credit card. And just before Christmas, I was credited a cashback reward of £190. And again, I've not bought anything that I wouldn't normally buy. So it's free money in that sense. The next one that I picked out off that list was to become a mystery shopper. This is an interesting one. If if you've got the time on your hands, then you can get paid to be a mystery shopper. Most of the time, you'll find that the assignments you're given is to go to a particular shop or restaurant and you'll be asked to basically buy something then you'll get reimbursed and you'll need to fill in a questionnaire in terms of your experience so it's a good way to get some free food and also some extra cash and maybe sometimes you can actually keep the items that you're purchasing in the shops if they're low value items that one does require a bit of extra work you're not going to get rich quick on it but it is something to do if you've got some spare time I actually did this myself when we were a bit low on money when we had our first child and my wife was on maternity leave the money was a little bit tight so it was a good way for us to earn a little bit of extra money and actually go out from time to time and eat for free. So uh, it's definitely recommended. I have done it. You can make it work. The final one I'm going to focus on before passing over to Damien for his top five is becoming an audiobook narrator. Now, this seems a little bit specialist and a little bit out there, but honestly, it's easier than you think. There are thousands and thousands of self-published books. We talked about my self-published book earlier that are just waiting for people to go ahead and voice those books. So if you enjoy voicing characters, if you've got a passion for reading out loud, let's say you enjoy reading to your child, that is good enough experience to get out there and try yourself as an audiobook narrator you can go on amazon pick up a cheap mic for maybe 10 to 50 pounds and you literally with the internet you are set to go there is something called Amazon ACX, which is the area in line in which you can actually peruse the jobs and you can actually put your audition forward. You literally just press record. The software does it all for you and you submit it off. And if you get chosen, you can then go ahead and record those books and you'll get paid a decent wage for doing so. And so Damien, there's my five favorite from that list of 50. I have to say though, Andy, because you'd said you tried all five of the things. I was I was hoping you were going to say life modeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that is in the list. You're you're giving away more of the list. <laughs> you could have earned between apparently ten to twenty pounds an hour, so around a hundred to one hundred fifty pounds a day. And there's some links in the article to where you can go and, and do that. So, I mean, I'm impressed with your list, Andy, but I am disappointed. Life modeling was on it. Knowing you, Andy, as well as I do, it would not surprise me if one day you told me you'd actually done life modeling because you've pretty much done every other madcap scheme of making money. Right on to my five. The first one is start your own blog. Now, this is obviously at the core of Money to the Masses. Now, those of you who don't know the story, back in 2010, just after my daughter was born, I started a blog which was called Money to the Masses from the very start. And I worked in the city and started to put out there the information and knowledge that I had that was in my day job being charged out for ridiculous sums of money to wealthy clients. And at the time, there was no money advice service or no good way for ordinary people like me, like you, Andy, to get the information or expertise or guidance that I could provide. So that's where Money to Masses came from. It's born out of a passion to help people. But it was a blog. And what is a blog? A blog is just an online notebook, really. It's a website that you can just publish an article that is all a blog is so it's just like saying having a website and it's so easy now to start them they have their templates where you can start to just type into and produce really good looking websites so justin who is 
Obviously, my twin and those of you who have met him know that he deals with a lot of the tech side of the stuff in the business. Now, obviously, we have other people who do a lot of the tech stuff in the background developing the website. But in the early days, he did it. And you could just start a blog by writing about something you're really passionate about. It's not a quick way to make money. I never started Money to the Masses aiming to make money. After four years of doing it, I then did go full time in an attempt to make it make money because the audience had grown to such a size that I had to do something. I either had to give up doing it and concentrate on my day job, which I was still doing at that point, or try and make money into the masses become something much bigger. And ultimately for me, a means to be able to support my family as well while I was helping people. So it costs little to set up your own website, but you can, in the long run, create a business from a passion that you have. So I'm a real advocate of this, but this is a bit like the long-term aim. So making money online, but the long-term, you've got to keep chipping away at it. Whatever you do, whatever your passion is, you will just produce day after day after day after day after day as a habit. And eventually people will start to notice if what you do is valuable and it adds value and people enjoy it. So start your own blog is number one. Then number two is affiliate marketing. So if you've got a social media presence, it could be Facebook, for example, or you have your own website, you can make money through affiliate marketing. So affiliate marketing is where you have a link to a product or service that when people click through to it, via your link it's identified to the company where they've gone to purchase the goods or services and then you make some money in return for providing a customer for that company now again it's not necessarily lucrative if you haven't got a large audience you won't make lots of money overnight but if you've got an audience that is engaged and they want solutions to things it is a way of making money from what you do online so affiliate marketing if you go and look at any website where martin lewis anything out there they will make money via affiliate marketing and they might not always disclose it money to the masses we obviously make some of our revenue from affiliate marketing it's always disclosed if we are going to make money but we allow people to click through without having to click on our link so we always do things in a genuine way so if we like a product and we happen to be able to pay the bills keep the lights on with a commercial agreement with a company then that that's great, but it doesn't matter if we don't. We still give our honest view. Next, sell gadgets. That's another thing you can do online. So it could be old phones. These are things that I've done in the past. You could sell things obviously on eBay or Facebook Marketplace is quite a good one, actually, if you're not really into eBay. So if you upgrade phones, technology, you can sell the old stuff and make money. Bank switching. So if you go to the Money to the Message website and you search for best bank account switching offers, you can find a whole host of banks that are now offering cash incentives. And I've done a YouTube video. If you search our YouTube channel, you will find a video on there as well, me talking about the latest deals. You can earn, for example, £175 for switching your current account to another bank. So if you're in the market for moving and you have no sense of loyalty to your existing bank, why should you? Then there is a way of you being able to make money from switching bank accounts. And of course, there are refer a friend schemes if you like a product or service it doesn't have to be online it can be something offline you can make money by referring a friend to that service if they're going to buy it i have to say i'm not a fan of people who just try and make money out of their friends by saying here's a service you should buy because i make some money and you do too if they generally like something and you both can enjoy some sort of referral from it then that is great the final one i'm going to say is you can actually sell photos online now i've not done this but it's one that i picked up because i think it's quite interesting if you like taking pictures, so even on your mobile phone, you are able to sell them for cash online. There are websites such as Stock Emo and Alamy, which you can find links to in the full article, because we're going to put the link to the article in the notes of this podcast, and you get a cut of each photo that is sold. And if you sell a lot of them, then you could make a decent income. So if you're a budding photographer, then that could be a way of making some good money on the side. So there you go, Andy. That is my shortlist. As we mentioned at the beginning of the piece, we want the full list of 50. We'll probably keep adding to it, to be honest. It starts with 50. We'll probably add more. Then click on the link in the notes of the podcast. And please, if you've got any others that you want to add to the list, then leave them in the comments on the website. Or more importantly, start a thread in our Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash money to the masses. Great. So that's pretty much it for this week. I'd just like to take the opportunity to welcome any new listeners that have come across 
too money to the masses because they've made a New Year's resolution or they just want to sort their finances out, you're very welcome. Podcasts usually last from anywhere between 25 minutes and 50 minutes. And Damien and I will normally cover three subjects with one of those subjects nearly every week will be something to do with investing as that's Damien's specialty. So welcome along. Any existing listeners, of course, please do feel free, as you always do, to share the podcast. Or if you haven't already, please do leave us a podcast review in the usual places. So also make sure you follow us on our social channels. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. And back on episode 352 of this podcast, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. We did a whole episode about getting the most from money to the masses. The only change that was in there is that we do the investment update monthly now rather than weekly. But that's the only change. So that is it. I hope everybody has a happy new year and a fantastic 2023. And so that all that's left for me to say is until next time. Until next time. Oh.